to Kill Meta. With me is Daniel Rotter, and we are the Baltimore Bird Watchers. So excited to bring you this playoff preview episode. The Orioles have made the playoffs, secured the top wild card spot, winning five of their last six games to cash their win total over for the season, which was 90 and a half wins. Top L wild card, they'll be hosting the Kansas City Royals. Uh, series starts tomorrow. Daniel, how are you feeling? I'm feeling really good. I mean, I know that there was a lot, a lot of disappointment, a lot of anxiety about how the postseason would go in like July, August, early September. But it feels like with everybody back, something's starting to click. And hey, this team made it to 91 wins. We're a legit regular season team. We're not some kind of fluke who made it in. We have experience now after last year. And I, I just can't help but think we can beat anybody if we do everything you know the best we can we don't make stupid mistakes yeah yeah and I think you know you mentioned injuries and like that's obviously been such a big factor finally getting guys like Westberg back even Urias with that little stint he was out because he was in so well before that so having him back is big uh disappointing that they shut down Grayson for the season he just didn't have time to get um get up but I think other than that like you said not only have you know the players come back from injuries that we're going to have this season, uh, the recoveries that we can get this season. Um, but they're also winning. Uh, it feels like the magic's back. Um, I, I went to a couple games recently and it really felt like the magic was back at Camden yards. And that kind of leads me to my question. Cause this is something that you've talked about before on this podcast, Daniel, which is getting hot at the right time, how the playoffs are, you know, last year, this is a, spectacular example of how much the playoffs rely on getting hot at the right time do you feel like this Orioles team is getting hot at the right time or are you not convinced um I I think that we're hotter than we were I, I think we're still getting a lot of contribution from guys that are mostly complimentary pieces at least on the offensive side I will say obviously Gunner has been great Kowser played great down the stretch um, but we did see great performances from James McCann, Emmanuel Rivera, uh, Jackson Holiday down the end of the end of the last two series, the end of the season. And so for me to look at our best nine and say everyone's hot at the right time, I, I don't know, because, again, Adley's, of course, been having his struggles. Mountie really hasn't gotten many at bats since he came off the I.L. Westberg and Arias have looked fine. But again, I don't know if we have enough data to say that that they're hot but it, it looks like the mojo's back um and, and on the pitching side the, the bullpen it's you know every night's going to be an adventure it, it's hard to say that the bullpen is hot or not because i think every single game is a completely different set of possibilities with this bullpen um, i will say i was i was talking big about gregory soto when he was struggling earlier in the year he's been pitching a lot better and i, I think that he might need some high leverage uh spots as far as you know the other options that we have in this bullpen not looking very great. And then starting pitching, look, we all know what Dean Kramer is. Yes, he's been pitching well. Is he good? No, but he is like an average pitcher, so hopefully he can give us some decent innings. Yeah, I think it's funny. Daniel and I were talking about that question before the podcast, and I told him I had a couple different ways to go with it. And he ended up kind of touching on a lot of the same thoughts that I had uncertainty about exactly what this lineup looks like and who you can rely on um but the vibes are headed in the right direction they're figuring out how to hit with runners in scoring position again and it's just little things like that that are really important for this team to just consistently get runs on offense and not only rely on the long ball the way i was gonna go the thing that i think is really this team's pitching is getting hot at the right time specifically your two lead men in the in the in the starting rotation in Burns and Eflin they both had really good August it feels like that is a really really strong one too I think the overall weakness of the Orioles pitching has kind of dragged down their ranking among the playoff teams but I think that top two is maybe just as good as almost any top two in the postseason so I think to me that is where the team is getting hot which is they have the starting pitching and if they can just build up leads in the middle innings and not have to worry about squeaking out every game down the stretch. Um, I think they'll have a good shot at these playoffs. If they get involved in a lot of late inning dog fights, I just don't know if they have the firepower uh, from, as they're from their bats or from their pitching to, to do that. Yeah. And, and I think at least as far as our first series go, 
Um, the Royals also have a bit of a weakness in their bullpen. So I think late in the games will definitely be very interesting, at least in this wild card round. They did um, bolster their bullpen a bit when they picked up Lucas Erceg at the trade deadline, who has been a phenomenal pickup. And I really wanted us to get him. He has a lot of years of team control left. So I thought that was an intriguing pickup. Uh, I, I know they probably had to pay a, a bit of a pretty penny prospect wise, even though he was, he was kind of just a this year um, breakout story. But before that, their closer was, was James MacArthur, who I believe is on the injured list now. And, and he wasn't good. So there's a lot of question marks in their bullpen. And then our strengths are kind of, swap their their big big strength is their strength in the starting rotation and our big big strength is our lineup and, and we they have some some good aspects of their lineup they have Bobby Witt Jr. who's a top three player in the MLB I mean we have Corbin Burns in our rotation who is a top five to ten pitcher in the MLB but other than that there's some weaknesses on both sides there so I, I think that we're weirdly an evenly matched game but not for the exact same reasons yeah, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. And we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about how the Orioles could win this series and what ways they could lose it as well later on. Um, but before that, I wanted to get an idea of what this playoff roster is going to look like. So Daniel and I are just going to go back and forth naming players that we have on our individual playoff rosters. And as soon as we hit uh, a player that we disagree on, um, we'll kind of hash that out and then decide who makes it on the Bird Watchers final playoff roster. And I want to so, preface this by saying Nikhil has a roster in front of him. I do not. I'm just going to be firing. So if I say anybody way too late, please don't come at me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like you're gonna. Uh, you were you reminded me of someone I didn't have on anyway. So um, go ahead and start, Daniel. Ooh, I'll go with Gunner. That's an easy one. We're not going to talk about each name because some of these are very obvious. Adley Rushman. Kowser, Santander, Mullins, Westberg, McCann, Urias, Mountcastle, O'Hearn. Oh gosh. Um, so now we're getting into the nitty gritty. Holiday is going to be our speed off the bench. Yep, I agree with that. Um, I have I have Kerstad making this playoff roster. Um, I think. One, his bat is, I think now that he is fully back and he's looked, he looked pretty good in some of his at-bats once he got back to the majors this season, I just think that his potential to get hot is really important in this lineup that doesn't have a ton of depth. So I'm kind of going with a higher variability option because I want to capture the top end of that range of outcomes. Well, gosh, I mean, and we, we haven't gotten to the other two guys who are kind of in this contention, but there's there's two spots for three guys who have been mm -hmm. on our team at the end of the year. It's between Slater, Kerstad, and Emmanuel Rivera. And I think Emmanuel Rivera is going to make it just because we don't have a lot of options, or at least we don't have any options at first base um, and outfield sets so a DH against lefties. Mm -hmm. Like our options there are kind of Kerstad or O'Hearn. Or if we want to double down on catchers mid-game and not allow ourselves any flexibility, it could be McCann. But I think Rivera will make it just because of that. And so it's kind of between Heston and Slater. And it's like, well, what do you value? Do you value a good pinch hitter or do you value a better defensive replacement? And, and, and potential speed guy. Uh, yeah, right. And a second potential speed guy off the bench, which could be valuable as well. I think in this short wild card round, I would value the better pinch hitter, like we were talking about Heston, and I, I would take Heston and leave Slater off. But I think once you get into those, we make it to any best of sevens, man, I, th I think Slater becomes more interesting because there's going to be more games, I think, where we're going to have to do some awkward substitutions and, and get deeper into our bench. And, and Slater might end up being the, the better candidate for the roster in those deeper series. Yeah, I think that's absolutely a good point. Really, the makeup of the roster for this three-game series is such a different thing to consider. Um, we're going to get into the pitchers in a second, but one name you're probably not going to hear is Albert Suarez, because Suarez just pitched. He's not expected to start. You know, he's not going to be, uh, you know, uh, recover. He won't have enough rest before one of these three games to start, and they wouldn't want to put him in relief in that case either. They'd much rather save him for a potential ALDS start rather than, you know, pitching him on a short rest in a wild card game, that that just wouldn't feel right, wouldn't make sense. So, you know, you think about that, you know that you're going to face one lefty in this series, um, and that may mean that you want, um, that you would rather have um, 
that you might have Mullins actually off the bench as a, as a defensive replacement and pinch runner as well in that game against a lefty. In a seven-game series, you can't really worry about, well, you know, we're going to face a lefty twice. you got to be planned for the whole series. In a three-game series, you can kind of plan a little bit more day by day. And I think that's why um, – I think that's why Kerstad and Rivera make this roster and Slater don't. Um, so that's 13 – uh, position players now let's go back and forth and name 13 pitchers for the Royals to fill up their roster Burns Eflin Kramer I think Povich is going to be the long man out of the pen um, I agree I with he, you yeah I think he closed I think he really closed out the season pretty well I was I was pretty happy with how he did he had a big bump in his strikeouts which I think is super encouraging for next year hopefully mm-hmm. he puts on a little muscle and gets that fastball below up too but I will say if we have to go to our long man in this series, that's not a good sign. Yeah. Um, as far as someone else in the bullpen, I'll go, I'll go with my guy. I'll go with Soto. Uh, Yenny Cano. Dominguez. Uh, Danny Kaloum. Aiken. Uh, Cienel Perez. Webb. And I think these last two spots are, again, the ones that we're going to be debating over. I have Colin Selby making this playoff roster. Colin Selby is actually kind of gross. I, I, I wish I had a little bit more uh, time to watch him in uh, in the regular season up with the big league team because every time I watch him pitch, his pitches are diving. The, they're going in all directions. So I, I don't think that that's a bad call. And I think that a lot of the other options are not very inspiring. Like we saw Brian Baker completely shit his pants against the Rangers last year in the playoffs. Like I, I don't think Selby is necessarily a worse option than Baker for sure. <laughs> All right, so then who's your last add to the roster? Who's yours? I have Matt Bowman. So, it, so it's the two spots for Bowman, Baker, and Selby? Yeah, I think so. Um, there's a chance they bring up Trevor Rogers, but I don't, I don't really see that. Um, same thing with Brooks Krisky, but again, I don't think they saw enough out of him uh, to warrant keeping him up, certainly not in his appearances, so. Wow. Um, that's tough because I, I don't love Bowman against really good hitters. I, I think he's kind of like that, like that crafty righty soft tossing archetype. And maybe I'm just a little bit of recency bias that at, that at bat he had against judge where a judge just kind of grinded him out, swinging at his tough pitches. And then he finally leaked something over the middle and it was just like a hanging soft slider and judge absolutely crushed it. Um, the Royals are, Fairly right-handed heavy. I'm trying to go through their team right now. All these guys are righties, I guess. I don't know. I guess we could keep Bowman because he is a, a veteran. And he, he has, I guess, solid command, which is something that a lot of this bullpen lacks. So, sure, I'm fine with Bowman. Baker and Selby, I mean, man, I feel like they're almost a coin flip. Like, Baker has a, a hard fastball. Sure, I mean, he can gas it up. But the control can sometimes be a problem. And sometimes that hard fastball is, is just flat and it, it gets hit. Um, and then Selby's got good breaking stuff. But again, we haven't really seen much of anything from him in in the majors this season. So that feels like a big spot to thrust him into. I, I think I might have that last guy in the pen, unfortunately, be Baker. Just because I don't know what to expect from Selby. And I think that's where we can split. Because like I was saying earlier, um, in terms of adding Kerstad to the roster and trying to capture like that high range of outcomes – if so, we can just come in and baffle the world's pitchers for one inning across these three games. I think that's a success. Uh, the world's hitters, I mean, across one inning across these three three games. I think that's a huge success. And build him confidence to potentially be a factor in the ALDS if that stuff is really working. With Baker, I just think even if he does put up a good performance in the wild card, I just I still don't trust him down the stretch in the ALDS and for, and further on. And I would rather just give Selby a shot and see if like he can just get his stuff working and get one strong inning together and and get a little belief in himself to pitch in this postseason. With Baker, I just I really think that I really think it's the fact that he has the the control issues and a foul fastball that pop up at the same time. So he either can't place his fastball or it's just why it, or it's just right over the plate. And I think that I would much rather take the potential of Selby than what I feel like is just maybe you get an inning out of Baker, but I don't think that builds into anything bigger. To be fair, I, I don't think either of these pitchers 
are very, very good. Uh, like, I don't think either of them will have a big impact. And if we do have to use them in like the 12th inning of a wild card game, I really hope the other team's bullpen is in just as bad of a spot. <laughs> yeah. I, and I think that's the other thing is you're building, you know, a 13 man pitching roster. Okay. You're going to have three starters. Ideally, I mean, ideally, right. The, and we'll get to this in a minute. Ideally, the Orioles win this in two, but supposing it goes three. You know, they're probably going to need to use three or four pitchers on the first on each of the first two nights, if not if probably for each of the first two nights, um, you know, the two starters, two relievers each of the nights. And then they have the rest of the back end, the rest of the bullpen for the, that third game. And ideally, you don't have Selby in there unless it goes in extras on any of the nights. I would say the same thing for probably Bowman. Because you can pitch Dominguez, Cano, Coulomb, Perez, Aiken. So you can pitch a lot of those guys multiple times across three days. It's not ideal, but I think you, they absolutely should. So um, we said CNL when we were naming pitchers, right? Yeah, yeah. We okay, got all right. Just making sure. <laughs> yeah, we got to, we got to 26. Um, and I, I don't think there are any surprises. Really, I think, you know, the timing of Suarez's start means they have not spot open for that. Um I don't think there are really any other big surprises because obviously, you know, Grayson couldn't come back, Mateo couldn't come back. And at that point, it kind of simplifies some of the decisions, but it's one less decision you have to make because it's made for you. So moving on to the Royal starting rotation, um, they have Seth Lugo, Cole Raggins, and Michael Waka scheduled to pitch against the Orioles. Um, that's going to be a matchup of, like we said earlier, Corbin Burns, Zach Eflin, and Dean Kramer. How do you feel about that pitching matchup? How do you feel about the Royals starters? Well, the Royals starting rotation has been a huge strength of theirs all year. And a big part of that coming from two free agent signings this offseason who, who were in no way the headliners of the, of the offseason, uh, bringing in Seth Lugo and Michael Waka, who I believe are both on one or two year deals. I don't remember exactly which. And, and they've both been... Great. Lugo and Waka both were on the Padres last year. They're pretty steady, veteran arms. They're, they're kind of soft tossing, um, but, but they have, they're, they're able to work their way through those middle innings very consistently. I think Lugo is more of an innings eater, whereas Waka kind of ends up being more, a bit more of a strikeout artist on occasion, kind of like a five and dive, maybe six max innings type of guy, which is why you'll see Lugo in game two. But look, I mean, the ace of the staff is Cole Reagan's. I mean, he absolutely burst onto the scene last year after he was traded to the Royals from Texas on the Aroldis Chapman trade, which, which helped push their bullpen to a World Series. But as soon as they started giving him run in the rotation, I mean, he shined. And as a big fantasy baseball player, he was a guy that I was targeting in my drafts. I got him in a couple of leagues, and he had just a fantastic season. 186 innings, 223 Ks. I mean, he's not as good as Tarek Skubal. We are missing the best pitcher in baseball, mm -hmm. um, thank goodness. But – Look, Reagan's is, I mean, he's top 15, maybe top 10 by some metrics. He's great at getting strikeouts. I think I saw somebody from MLB Network compare him to Andy Pettit, um, just a tough lefty with good poise. But, but the interesting thing is we've seen Reagan's twice this year. We saw him back-to-back -back weeks in April. The first time we saw him, he absolutely shoved against us. I think it was seven innings, one hit, no runs. The next time we saw him, we jumped on him. I think we got seven or eight runs in the second by the second inning. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. was probably his, one of his best and worst starts of the season came against us in back-to-back -back starts or, or maybe two out of three starts. So it's, it's hard to know exactly what to expect because, I mean, he stymied us and then we jumped on him right after. So he, as far as his season went, he was one of the best pitchers in baseball. Um, but who knows what to expect when the O's face him again. Yeah, and that was all the way back – in April. Um, so that is really just, you know, such a long time ago to have faced him. So it gives you confidence that, okay, it was a very different team, very different lineup then, but you know, you're capable of hitting him. And so, you know, the tough thing is he's also capable of putting you down for, for, you know, six and a third, seven innings, whatever he did. So obviously him matching up with Burns, is, that's going to be the marquee matchup. It's going to be ideally, you know, a pitcher's duel. That's a game where Burns really needs to take seven innings, one earned kind of stat line to me to help match what uh reagan's is going to put up against the orioles because i could see the orioles going through seven innings with only getting a couple runs of their own against him and you know the last thing they really can do is afford to give up these games with uh burns and efflin pitching in the wild card i mean especially with burns pitching it just feels like a must win when pitching is so much a risk the rest of the series 
And in addition to that, just the importance of the first game in a wild card series is unreal. Last year, there were no wild card series games that went to uh, the third game. They all mm-hmm. were two game sweeps just because I think the team um, kind of just like exhausts every option in that second game. And there can be questionable managerial decisions. I think there was one with Toronto last year. Didn't they pull Jose Barrios like super early mm-hmm. to try and go to their bullpen in, in game two? And it just yep. did not work out. They ended up losing. Um, so there can you can just really get a manager in a very tight spot going down 1-0 and in a best of three. So, I mean, look, Burns has been awesome um, down the stretch here, and, and there's no reason not to expect another great start against the Royals lineup, who is, it, is all right, but I think is one of the weaker lineups in the postseason field, even despite having a top three overall player in baseball, in my opinion. Yeah, to me, it's about not letting, not letting wit hurt you. I think we've seen Burns give up some – some just like random solo shots and it feels like he, he just didn't have best control of a pitch. And I think he's really just got to work on getting wit out and not letting wit be the centerpiece of any big Royals rallies um, game two. I'm really looking for Eflin to outduel Lugo. I really think that he can pitch better than Lugo and Lugo is exploitable by the Orioles. Um, and again, hopefully um Hyde isn't in the position where he's pulling out all the stops and taking out Eflin early. Um, and if you can really get two solid starts out of these guys, that doesn't, that means a lot, not just for these two games, but for the whole postseason in terms of keeping your bullpen fresh. So as much as I'm looking for Burns to have a big game, I'm looking for Eflin to have just another one of his quiet, you know, six or seven innings, two, two earned runs kind of game where he just doesn't allow a lot of base runners and doesn't make mistakes out over the plate. I, and another thing about, about this game two matchup, which is kind of funny, I think Eflin and Lugo are very similar pitchers. Um, neither of them are super high velocity fastball pitchers. They both throw a lot of different pitches. They're both crafty righties. Um, and, and they've made their way on, on getting good movement on their pitches. Seth Lugo, I think, has thrown like 10 different pitches throughout the course of this year. Eflin, I see he's sitting at six different pitches and, and he throws the cut and the sink at an equal amount. So both of these guys are really trying to intimidate you by having the ball dive in all different directions. And it's less so like the Burns Reagans matchup where they're both coming at you with heat. Yeah. I think that's really excellent analysis and kind of a neat way to watch these two games as two lineups that are arguably built around superstar shortstops try to change their attack from one night to another. And I think this is, a lot of people were talking about, oh, the hitting coaches during the slumps and all that. And I think all that talk was a little overblown. To me, this is the better test of hitting coaches, which is can they take a strategy against Reagans in the first matchup and then make the right changes and tweaks in conversation with their guys in their coaching for that second matchup against Lugo and not have them going up look with the same approach. To me, that's really where a hitting coach can come in in this in this game. And then the third game, of course, Dean Kramer versus Michael Waka. Um, is it is it too harsh to say that that's a battle of the mid? Um, I just I just don't I'm just not really inspired by you those pitchers. To me, that's more a measure of who can get through five innings while giving up fewer runs. Uh, and especially if that's game three, it may not even be five innings. If Kramer feels a little shaky, or maybe High just goes with an opener with Kramer for three four innings, and then goes to Povich intentionally. I think I think that leaves them. I think having Povich in the bullpen leaves them a lot of options for game three. Should it get that far? Yeah, I, I think Waka's resume clearly indicates that that he's a better pitcher. I mean, I, I think each of the past three years, he's had a sub five ERA or sorry, sub three, five. Of course, he's had a sub five. He's starting a playoff <laughs> game, Daniel. Um, but he's he's thrown a good amount of innings. And I think he he's just good at, at limiting damage. Um, and, and Dean Kramer is what I always talk about when, when I'm watching Dean Kramer. He usually just has that one loss of focus inning is usually what, what I'm talking about with, with people when I'm watching the game where where he is kind of Waka-esque through the first three innings, first four innings, and then there's that one inning where like shit happens. And then suddenly you're looking at his line and he has three or four runs. So if we could avoid the loss of focus inning for Dean Kramer, I think that would be an even matchup. But I think I would take Waka personally over Kramer if I were to just have my pick of the two. Yeah, and that actually kind of leads me into one of the one of the points I wanted to make in this podcast, which is I think the Orioles win this series with their starting pitching in the first two games. I feel like I've hit on this 
a bunch of times in the pod, but I think it's worth saying they finally have this kind of one-two punch that can go in and just kind of take over a playoff series. And I think if Burns and Eflin can just be the best versions of themselves, you don't even need to worry about Kramer in game three. To me, that's the biggest way. The, the biggest way the Orioles can win the series is with strong starts and Burns and Eflin and not let their weaknesses define those games, not let their issues with runners and scoring position define those games, not let their bullpen define those games. If they're, if those games can be defined by Burns and Eflin, they'll be in control of it. And I think they'll be in a better spot than the Royals. Cause like you said, that Royals lineup, like if they're struggling against Burns and Eflin, the Orioles just have better chance against L- uh, Reagan's and Lugo, just speaking in how what the talent comparison. See, I, I'm honestly expecting uh, pretty good things from those, star- those starters that you mentioned. That they're both veterans, Burns and Eflin, and I, I think we'll kind of avoid the like the Grayson just complete blow up on the mound in, in mm-hmm. Game Two of the ALDS last year, um, where the moment was a little too big. But I will say I think that this will be won and lost by bullpens because neither of these teams have the strongest bull. There's a lot of great bullpens from teams in this postseason. This matchup is got to be two of the worst. Um, neither of us really have like a few guys even on, on each side that can, that can close the door in some high leverage spots. I, I think Urseg is probably – the best reliever out of either of these bullpens, but I think maybe us having, you know, this kind of combination of, of high velocity arms might make our five best a little better than their five best, but both of these bullpens are extremely vulnerable and it's kind of just who can take advantage in my opinion in, in these high leverage spots late in the game. Yeah. And which manager can, can pull the right levers and, and work the right matchups. And, you know, I don't, we definitely do not have time to get into what those right ma- right and wrong matchups are going to be versus different hitters in the Royals lineup. Um, but that does bring me to speaking of lineups, what do you see as the Orioles lineup uh, versus lefties and righties? I was thinking we could do the same thing as we did with the rosters, just name players we expect to see in the lefty lineup and then name players we expect to see in the righty lineup. So I'll go ahead and start against lefties. Pretty sure Gunnar Henderson's going to be playing shortstop. Yeah, and and just to preface, I think there's a couple of decisions that I've seen people kind of disagreeing about as far as what our game one lineup will be, and, and we can get into that in a second, uh, just based on that format. But there, there's we might disagree on a couple of things because we haven't talked about this. Uh, Cows are still going to play lefty lefty, obviously. Yeah, Santander is going to play every game. Uh, Westberg is going to play. Yeah, I think obviously Rutschman's going to be behind the dish. Ramon will be playing. Yeah, you got him at third. Westberg at second. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have that too. Um, I still think against a left-handed pitcher, I'm putting Mountcastle at first base. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Mountcastle will be playing first base. Um, I, I think Mullins is still playing against the lefty. I know you expressed some doubt about that, but I would have him in there. You So you'd have Kowser in left and Mullins in center. Okay, interesting. I was, was thinking potentially putting Slater in, in left, but I, I think Mullins has really earned – the right to play in these games, to be the starting center fielder pretty much every day. I mean, he has had a really good last month, I'd say. I don't know exactly what the stats are, but I think he is, I mean, he, I feel like he effectively turned his season around from what it was. Um, so you put Mullins in center, Kowser in left, Santander is in right. Um, that just leaves us with the DH. Um, and I think against lefties, I think that's going to be Rivera. I, I think that is too. Um, and, and kind of going back to your point about, Bowens versus Slater dude I just think Slater's bad like it's not the regular season anymore there's literally no reason this guy should be starting in the playoffs like he, he's a bench player um I, I know that Cedric Mullins isn't 2021 Cedric Mullins anymore but Austin Slater actually his I think cumulative numbers now on the Orioles are are not good anymore like it, it's not you know mid-August like when he was kind of on that run hitting against lefties early he's not been good down the stretch and the only reason he's on this team is to be a late inning defensive substitution. As far as DH goes, I think that there's two options. We said earlier, you could go double catcher and put McCann in the game and DH Adley, or you could put Rivera at DH. I'm very much in favor of DHing Rivera as well, because I hate, I, I know that it makes sense to do it in the regular season sometimes when Adley needs rest catching. So he needs to DH and, and we want to put McCann a catcher. 
I hate tying our hands behind our back like that, having both of our catchers in the game. Because if one of them gets injured, if we have to drop the DH or something like that's just a horrible spot to be in. I think they're, you can't start both of them in a playoff game. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, especially since that is game one. If it was game two or three, you could think about it and because you'd have some idea of what happened and what options you have left. But I think in game one, there's, there doesn't make any sense. Um, games two and three, obviously going to be against Seth Lugo and Michael Waka, two right-handed pitchers. Um, I guess what from, from the nine that we just named, what swaps are you making? I can tell I mean, you, I think O'Hearn plays first over Mountcastle. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I put, I think well, I might have a critique. But go ahead. I think I probably have Mullins in center, Kowser in left. I think everything is pretty much the same. I probably DH Kerstad. Okay, so you are not having Malcastle play at all. I think I would have Malcastle playing first base because I do think he's our best first base defender. And I would have O'Hearn at DH, mm-hmm. and I would keep everything else the same. Okay, so you'd have cursed that available off the bench. I, I just don't see an avenue. Like, I, I know he was great in the minors, and I, I know he's a huge part of this team down the road. I don't really see a good spot to start him because I just think I trust O'Hearn more than Heston. I know Heston had a, a great game um, at, towards the end of the regular season at, at Camden Yards. I think he got on base like four or five times. But some of those at-bats down the stretch – he has been swinging at so much junk, dude. Like, he has been chasing some horrible pitches. I, I I, think I just trust O'Hearn starting more. Yeah, and I'm actually going back and looking at Mount Castle statistics since coming off, and as a small sample size. Um, but, you know, in September, he hit 381, you know, 793 OPS. Um, if that's, you know, the Mount Castle that's getting hot at the right time for the Orioles team, that, that could be a difference maker in the playoffs if he is able to start against righties and lefties and make a difference. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I think I like your lineups better, Daniel. I think uh, I think your critiques were pretty, pretty valid ones. Um, so that's going to leave um, Gunner, Kowser, Santander, Mullins, O'Hearn, Mount Castle, Westberg, Adley, and Arias in the lineup. Uh, against right-handed pitchers for games two and three. Um, I talked a little bit about this earlier, how I see the Orioles winning this series. You talked about it really coming down to the bullpen. In your heart of hearts, do you think the Orioles take this one? I'm I'm having a hard time because I feel like we're a very popular pick for this series. I feel like the Royals might be a little bit overlooked. Um, I mean – like the the fan in me says, I think we should win this series and I think we will, but I don't feel very confident if I'm being honest. I think that the Royals are going to bring it. They've kind of found this magic of their own. They lost a hundred games last season and now they're in the playoffs. Um, they have the best player on either side of the diamond and th- they're a little bit gritty. I, I can recall, I-, I know Salvador Perez usually hits very well against the Orioles and Michael Garcia was incredibly gritty against us last or in, in April. I remember he has great speed, um, solid third base defender, not much of a power hitter, but, but he was, I remember just, just finding holes, hitting hard ground balls. Um, I, I think that he's a guy who's very pesky and him in the leadoff spot, he has probably top five or better percent speed in the MLB. And then you go to wit hitting second who has, probably top 1% speed in the MLB. So they are going to friggin' run, especially against Burns and Adley. So mm-hmm. we got to be able to contain that in game one. Yeah, I think I think you really hit it on the head with that and what you said earlier about how last year every team won in two. Um, to me, it's going to come down to Burns' ability to just be a complete ace for game one and win the first game and put the Orioles, give the Orioles as many options as they can for game two and really put the Royals in the back foot. Because I think once you get this Royals team pushing, I think that's when Eflin can have a big day and put them away. you got to get them pushing. But I think if they win game one and it's the Orioles who push, I think it's exactly what you were saying earlier in terms of the, the corners that managers get backed into and how hard it would be to even win a game three if you even if you lost game one and then you, and then you won game two. Um, Ultimately, I go back to what I said. I think the Orioles get two strong performances out of their starting pitching. Um, and I think that is 
that is enough to keep them. I think in in in, in game one, I think they're going to have to win it in the late innings against the Royals bullpen. Um, I think in game two, they can score enough off of Lugo behind a strong performance from Eflin um, that they don't need to worry about any late inning magic. They just have to hold on with their bullpen. Um, uh, I have a question I've, I have for you real quick because I, I forgot to mention this earlier. We actually have not named Eflin our game two starter yet. Um, I'm assuming for some kind of strategic reasons. Would you save Eflin for game three or would you pitch him game two? Um, I think I'd pitch him game two. I think I'd go right at him. I don't think I would mess around with that. Um, I'm trying to think. There's no issue of rest, is there? No, no issue No, of if rest. there's no issue of rest, i go right at it in game two because I don't want to get to a game three. I think it, when you go into a game two, the other team wants to get to a game three and you don't want to get to a game three. So there's no reason to save anything, to save a starter for that game three that you don't want to be in. Um, I also think that's a... I think there's an argument to be made that's a lower stakes start for Kramer if he comes in a game two after winning game one. Um, so I think I would maybe consider it if we, if we won game one, I would consider it. Um, but I still believe in trying to win this in two. So another, I, I think that what you said is totally accurate. I, I agree. I would throw F in game two. It's a best of three series. Like you got to win. You have to win in game two you don't want it to go to game three in this series so i would do it An another angle that i was looking at it from which i hadn't thought of that lower stakes star from kramer that you said i think we're hoping if we win game one if, if we were to trot out kramer game two we can you know waltz our way into a lucky win i think we're hoping that we could start a yankee series with eflin kind of it is what we were you know hoping the best case scenario out of maybe going kramer game two is is well great now we get one of our best pitchers lining up in game one against the Yankees. My problem is uh, that game against the Yankees is not on the schedule yet because if we lose the series, we don't play them. So I would right. definitely have Eflin pitching game two, no matter what. Yeah. I think the only way I consider it to me is if Burns goes seven strong, you use up two pitchers in the next two innings and you have a full bullpen for game two and you can say we are just going to go out and win this game and you throw the bullpen at it to me again that's a risky strategy because all of a sudden you have to put Eflin on the mound with a tired bullpen your backs up against the wall in game three and and you've given up the advantage of potentially having him to start the ALDS um, so I agree I think winning in two is just just the priority and I'd rather see them maintain bullpen health over the course of this postseason than try and kind of hardly steal a win in game two basically yeah i i agree with all of that i think eflin's got to go game two and you know what if you make it to the yankee series guess what you worry about it then uh there's an off day between games one and two in the alds also i believe which is unusual that's that's something different this year so burns i think the calendar lines up that he would be good to go in game two and eflin would be good to go in game three even if they pitched games one and two of the wild card and so guess what you make it to game one of the ALDS and the wild card even goes to three. So you burn Kramer. I guess you go maybe three innings Suarez, three innings Povich to try and piece together um, a way that they don't have to face the Yankees lineup too many times. And, and you just hope that you come out of that game one. All right. Um, and, th and then you can loop it back around to, to your big dogs in the rotation. Exactly. Daniel. I, I think that's a, I think that's a phenomenal strategy and I'm really hoping that it plays out that way. Um, I'm excited. You excited? Yeah, man, I'm excited. I'll see you at the yard for game one, baby. Yeah, sounds good. I'll be there tomorrow. So will Daniel. And uh, yeah, we can't wait for these playoffs to get started. Uh, it doesn't have the same kind of magic feeling the Orioles had last year. It's been such a beleaguered season, but I think that's also a reason to go ahead and celebrate being here and still having the potential to make a run. So like we started off with, the Orioles just got to get hot at the right time. And that starts tomorrow at Camden Yards. Daniel, repping the chain, you going to bring it to the park tomorrow? Um, I don't know. We'll see. That, He's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to bring that in public. Uh, but uh, thanks so much for listening, everyone. And we'll be back with you after this postseason series.